I am pleased to be joined today by Patrick Coburn, correspondent for The Independent, who's been reporting from northern Iraq on the offensive underway in Mosul. Uh, Patrick Coburn, thank you for joining us. Thank you. Um, first, the offensive in Mosul has gotten a fair amount of attention in US media in recent days because of a strike that occurred on March 17th in which approximately 200 civilians were reportedly killed. Now, the US Army Chief of Staff, Mark Milley, has attempted to rationalize or justify this strike. And he claims that it's possible that ISIS blew up the building in order to blame it on the coalition so as to delay the offensive. Does that explanation strike you as plausible? I think there's a much simpler explanation, which is they drop bombs on this building and they kill people in it. You know, I've covered a great many air wars in the Middle East, you know, the Israelis and bombing uh, Beirut in 1982, the uh, 1991 uh, first Gulf War, the uh, Gaza, uh, Lebanon, um, 2003. And they, it always, there's always the same process, which is, first of all, the people carrying out the bombing saying that, say that they're doing absolutely everything to avoid civilian casualties. And uh, that goes on for a bit. And then there's some calamity like this in which they kill a lot of people. I don't know if people remember now the Amaria shelter in Baghdad in 1991 had 408 people, mostly women and children, uh, was hit by uh, two uh, smart bombs because um, the Pentagon had decided that it looked uh, a lot like a command center. Um, you know, it always happens. The thing is that people stress the accuracy of modern weapons, but the crucial thing is the intelligence. If you don't, you don't, if you don't know who's going to be on the receiving end, and they're never quite sure, then at some point you're going to hit a building with a lot of civilians inside it, and uh, you may try to uh, to deny it, or you may say that the other side did it. You know, they, I think they're saying they certainly the Iraqi military were saying that um, ISIS had packed booby traps into the walls, or maybe there was a vehicle suicide bomb outside. But actually, there's a very simple explanation, which is uh, they dropped bombs on a building uh, which contained probably ISIS fighters and a lot of civilians, because you can't, uh, the two are intermingled, and that's why they killed them. I can recall I can during recall the 2014, 2014 Israeli incursion in Gaza, Gaza, the trope that you would hear is that the people who were killed in a particular in a strike, strike were in some sense some culpable for their own deaths own because death. they were in close they proximity in to proximity. terrorists. So this seems like a pretty like recurring a trope, trope, almost trope, irrespective of what respect. conflict we're talking about. I think, you know, aerial bombing and artillery uh, Shellfire have always been uh, like this, you know, that uh, there have always been these claims of pinpoint accuracy. The truth is, if you have a city, if you have an urban area, a compact area, and uh, which contains uh, maybe an armed enemy, but certainly contains many more civilians, uh, you're going to kill a great many of them. And it's this kind of myth that you can somehow distinguish between the two. Uh, through the extreme accuracy of your weapons or whatever it is, you know, is, is against common sense. And invariably, they end up by killing a lot of civilians. So, uh, and that, I think that's what happened uh, this time. I was talking to a guy in, um, or was in contact with a guy in, uh, in behind, inside the ISIS-controlled uh, uh, West uh, Mosul. And uh, what happened, he put a bit of canvas on his roof I mean, you had been there already, but the Iraqi military and I guess the American air controllers had decided that this type of canvas is used by ISIS to conceal uh, fighting positions and munition dumps. And they've been bombing anybody who uses it. So they bombed his house. He got a very severe uh, wound in the leg. He had to try and hobble or crawl to the nearest clinic. They didn't have anything except bandages. You know, he crawled back to his house. This is pretty common. The American generals claim uh, or at least are suggesting at this point that the rules of engagement haven't materially changed 
under Trump um, compared to Obama. One of the generals does, has said that the commanders on the ground uh, were given greater leeway to call in strikes themselves in December with when Obama was still in office. Can you discern any change as of yet in the rules of engagement or does it seem consistent now between administrations? I think they might be a bit looser. You know, people have denied this uh, to me. I mean, Iraqi generals have denied it, uh, but I guess you might say they would, wouldn't they? Um, I think a lot of this has, you know, follows my previous point that if you let off high explosives in an area which contains a lot of people, you're going to kill a lot of them, you know. Uh, and that's what they were doing before, and that's what they're doing now. Um, I think that there's also in this particular uh, battle in Mosul, uh, previously on the uh, in East Mosul, um, the housing is a bit more separate. Uh, there are more open spaces. Uh, in West Mosul, the, the housing is much more compact. It's uh, it's um, uh, poorer. You know, it, it's older. You know, a lot of it is. You know, looks medieval. You know, with uh, narrow alleyways and uh, is pretty fragile. So you're going to kill more people if you drop bombs on it. Right. So I think it's just as important as changing the the rules of engagement if that's happened. So it, it's plausible, at least, that. The rules of engagement could be relatively constant, but when applied to a different area with a different level of concentration of civilians, the result might be a little more disparate. Yeah, I think that, you know, they killed an awful lot of people in East Mosul under, you know, the, the previous rules of engagement. Um, you know, that's coming out now. There was an amnesty report about it this week, uh, emphasizing uh, how many people had been killed there. They'd interviewed a lot of people. Now, that didn't really come across at the time. It was very noticeable in the uh, Battle for East uh, Mosul, which started October the 17th, went on about three months, that there was very little attention given, certainly by the media, to the uh, number of civilians who were being killed. And it was an extraordinary contrast to the attention given to what was happening in East Aleppo in Syria at the time, which you remember culminated in December. Uh, but, you know, you really had to look very hard to find information about this. The Iraqi government doesn't announce uh, civilian or military casualty figures. Uh, but I noticed uh, uh, towards the end of December that the, suddenly the Kurdish health minister had uh, Kurdistan is uh, close to Mosul announced that, you know, suddenly said all his hospitals in Kurdistan were full of wounded and injured people from Mosul. He said, that, you know, there were about 15,000 people. Um, you know, nobody had given a figure before. So I think that nobody expressed much shock what happened previously. So suddenly, you know, and we've seen this before in previous air campaigns, there's a, sin a, a single incident that suddenly reveals what really had been going on all the time. Uh, which is that these, uh, this bombardment uh, is killing a lot of people. As best you could tell at the time and you know, in, the, in the intervening months, what was the cause of that incredibly discrepant portrayal of the Mosul offensive for, versus the Aleppo offensive? Because they do have some basic well, strategic you know, similarities. Well, in East Aleppo, they were considered uh, you know, our boys. Uh, you know, it was a very strange coverage because you know, there were no foreign correspondents in East Aleppo because of people like, uh, um, if I'd gone there, if you'd gone there, we would have immediately been put in the boot of a car. Uh, we would have been kidnapped and probably murdered. So what we know about the guys who are running East Aleppo is that, you know, these are uh, Al-Qaeda or Al-Qaeda clones, uh, you know, with uh, who rule through terror. Um, that, but somehow this was never mentioned in the coverage of East Aleppo. Uh, while the coverage of Mosul was continual emphasis on the uh, uh, monstrosities of Islamic of ISIS. Uh, it's true about Aleppo, a bit true about Mosul, and it's true about East Aleppo, which mostly, you know, much of the coverage 
consisted of people inside East Aleppo, you know, showing pictures of bombed hospitals and uh, children being killed. All heartrending, I think all true. Uh, but that's equally true in Mosul. You know, an awful lot of children were killed there, but we never saw that. Um, so I think that there was an enormous difference in the way the two things were covered. Although the population of uh, probably the you know, beginning of this are about 1.2 million people in uh, Aleppo, and there were a bit over 100,000 in East Aleppo. You know, it was really only a tenth of the people in Mosul. Uh, so many more people, more people were probably being killed uh, last year in Mosul. At the same time, the whole uh, world was uh, crying out about what was happening in East Aleppo. And do you have any fundamental theories as to what accounts for that incredible disparity in coverage? Well, you know, it's, uh, you know, demonizing, these are civil wars in Iraq and Syria. You know, if you demonize one side and say everything wrong with Syria is to do with uh, Assad and basically give uh, his opponents a free pass, um, then, you know, dropping bombs on East Aleppo simply seems like a war crime. Uh, and it's pretty bad. This doesn't give a free pass to Assad. You know, it's a pretty bad regime. But if you reported, you must also seldom saw in the coverage there. Uh, you never saw the guys, in, but I have a, I watched a lot of this. You never saw the guys who are running East Aleppo, who are were uh, essentially uh, Al Qaeda or people allied to Al Qaeda. Uh, the UN said there were eight to ten thousand fighters there. You pretty well never saw those. It was basically the uh, the suffering of uh, civilians, wholly real to my mind. Uh, the bombing of hospitals. This certainly was happening. Uh, but uh, um, you know, if you only cover that. If you only cover that suffering, you get um, a very distorted picture of what was there, unless you say who was running the place. And uh, this was also an armed camp. In Mosul, we'd, we'd seen much less hitherto of uh, because of uh, children who've been killed or injured, uh, of the suffering of people inside. And the emphasis has been much more on uh, the evils of ISIS there. Uh, you know, all these are true, but they're always a very obvious if you compare the two uh, disparity in the way in which the media covered these two places. Well, there's a sort of admission of what East Aleppo was like by the very fact, you know, that most media, newspapers, television have brave reporters, that they didn't dare send them there because they knew they'd be murdered by the guys who were running this place. But this, that's why they were so reliant on local informants. But these local informants couldn't have operated except under license from, you know, the Al-Qaeda types who are running East Aleppo. Uh, or they would have suffered the same fate that we would have if, if we were there. Whenever the Iraqi military discusses the coalition forces, they're referring to the United States as liberators kind of is reminiscent of the rhetoric that was used during the 2003 invasion. Is the language of liberation something that you, as far as you can gather, would be affirmed by people within Mosul? Do they view the United States forces as a, as a liberatory intervention? Or um, is that exaggeration? Well, you know, it's different from 2003 because that was uh, you know, an invasion by American forces. The guys who are fighting on the ground here are, you know, the Iraqi army, the uh, different parts of the uh, Iraqi armed forces. Uh, secondly, you know, bad though Saddam was, Saddam is not as bad as ISIS, you know. A lot of people in Mosul, uh, you know, uh, have uh, suffered very badly from ISIS. So yeah, a lot of them would see themselves as uh, being liberated. But you know, I always have a problem with describing things in Iraq that you know it's not between. I don't. They really think you know. Uh, great the the one. They prefer the Iraqi army than ISIS in most cases. But 
they don't have great trust in the liberators either. I mean, I was um, the day before yesterday, I was uh, in a camp about uh, 30 miles south of Mosul, where people were coming in from uh, uh, refugees from Mosul were coming in. And you could see they're pretty glad to be out of Mosul because they were a bit bombed in danger of being killed. But they were pretty frightened to be in this camp run by the Iraqi army when they didn't quite know what they were facing. Um, you know, it's often thought that the people in danger in places like this are the women and children. Actually, it's the young men of military age. They're frightened that, you know, they'll be accused of having been members of ISIS, that they'll be tortured. Uh, um, somebody was saying to me, you know, they'd seen some uh, young men waiting to be uh, vetted, to be screened, and they'd never seen such frightened people in their life. Uh, so they're, they're frightened with every good reason for, of ISIS, but, uh, you know, they're, they're frightened when they deal with the Iraqi army as well. So uh, I think that uh, that's the way they look at it. You know, these people feel vulnerable from every corner and uh, they're dead right. Right, so perhaps identifying the United States forces or the coalition forces as liberators um, underplays the extent to which people are also fearful of, of them, maybe for different reasons. Yeah, I mean, it's not the primary thing that's happening uh, here in a way, you know, in 2003, it was all uh, the US uh, coming in, getting rid of Saddam. Um, it was a foreign army coming in. Now, yeah, it's obviously the US-led airstrikes play a big role. But people are kind of in this situation, people are always emphasize airstrikes, barrel bombs. Most of the destruction uh, here actually comes from artillery. Same thing in, in Syria, um, places being pounded by artillery. Um, people using rockets in the backs of uh, vehicles that aren't very, uh, aren't very accurate. Um, the, uh, so uh, they don't, you know, they don't see the US, they see the US as being an important player and kind of orchestrating in a way what's happening. But the, 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 you know, the ground fighting is done by the, by the Iraqi army uh, and uh, various uh, militias. Um, and so uh, um, there isn't the, the antipathy to that. Uh, that you might get if, uh, you know, when the U.S. Army was assaulting Fallujah in uh, 2004. Generally speaking, militarily, would it be correct to identify the Mosul offensive as of this point as successful? I mean, has it been successful in its aims? Yeah, it largely has. I mean, this was the great victory of ISIS in 2014. You know, they, you know, with a very small number of fighters, maybe, you know, maybe over a thousand, but uh, facing a garrison, which was meant to have 60,000 men in it. I mean, a lot of these were ghost soldiers, never there or, uh, and so forth, but at least, you know, minimum 20,000. So they're heavily outnumbered and they captured the place. Then they swept through northern Iraq. Uh, you know, they murdered a lot of people, Yazidis and uh Cadets they captured, famous massacre, 1,700 people killed. Um, and uh, they declared the caliphate now in Mosul. Now Mosul is falling, three quarters of it's falling. So this is a definite victory for Baghdad. Does it end the war? Slightly different question. But there's no, there's no doubt that this is a real, a real victory for them if they bring it off, and they probably will. You have a sense, um as to whether the most virulent ISIS fighters who are going to be fought into a corner, presumably as this offensive wears on to a conclusion, is it gonna be within in their interest to carry out some kind of extravagant attack, maybe a provocation, so as to send a message to whether it's Trump or someone else, um, really just kind of go out in the most extravagant form possible to sort of maximize their propagandistic influence? I don't think they're going to go out. I don't think that's the finish, because you know one of the things about ISIS is that 
you know, it's a, um, you know, a crazy, violent cult. But it's com- what makes it one of the things that makes it frightening. It's combined with a quite high degree of military expertise. Uh, these guys, um, you know, some of them were officers in Saddam's army, but that's probably not the main thing. They have a lot of military experience. So I don't think they're planning to go out of business. Probably they'll move. You know, they still control quite a lot of areas. They lost a lot of areas, but they still control areas. They'll probably move a lot of their commanders, their best people to those areas and continue to fight. They will have suffered a defeat, but they'll still be around. Uh, Now, the other part of the question is, you know, in the past, when they've suffered a defeat on the battlefield, they've struck back by by committing some atrocity inside Iraq or inside Syria or in Europe to show, you know, we're still around, we're still to be feared, uh, we can still dominate the news agenda for days on end, uh, we can show our strength. And yeah, so it's pretty likely they will do that. By the way, I mean, the, the emphasis tends to be on events in Paris or London, you know, but oh, the, the great mass, 95, 98% of these atrocities happen inside Iraq or Syria, mostly inside Iraq. You know, last year we had a bomb that killed uh, in Baghdad that killed 300 people one night, you know. Um, I think we had a bomb today that uh, killed 17 people in Baghdad, I mean, a suicide bomb. Uh, so they certainly will strike like uh, strike back like that, to my mind, to show, you know, we're still around and we're still to be feared. Trump has repeatedly pledged to wipe ISIS off the face of the earth or to completely extirpate it. And who knows what that entails in terms of military tactics. But is there any sense in which you could foresee him being able to claim credit for fulfilling that pledge um, as a result of the success of this offensive in Mosul? He probably will claim uh, success. Um, You know, what we're seeing in Iraq and Syria is mostly a continuation of what Obama was doing, but sort of downplaying before uh, the degree of American involvement in Iraq. You know, you have of 5,000, actually it's really the real figure is a bit higher of American advisors and trainers and forward air spotters and so forth. I think we have 12 American generals here uh, in various command positions uh, not so long ago. Similarly in Syria, they're playing a pretty active role. Now Trump is playing up more what they're doing, um, but basically it's the same policy. It's not true everywhere, you know, you can see in Yemen that uh, Trump is uh, giving much more support to the uh, Saudi-led uh, um, air attacks and uh, uh, there. Uh, but uh, here in Iraq and Syria, it's really uh, it's really pretty similar. Of course, he will play, uh, claim a tremendous victory, I guess, if Mosul falls. Uh, but really, the policy hasn't changed that much. Right. Uh, in the few minutes we have left, I wanted to turn briefly to Brexit. Um, this past week, the, Theresa May, the Prime Minister, formally invoked Article 50, and this is something mm-hmm. that you've commented on. Is, 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 do you see this as a seminal moment in the history of the United Kingdom where disunity now for the f- foreseeable future is inevitable? What is your reaction to this process being formally um, embarked upon? Now, what you strikes me in Britain and in England, uh, people used to sort of talk about them in, uh, you know, as if they, the two things meant the same thing. I think they're doing that a good deal less now, is that whatever else Brexit has done, it has divided people in England uh, and the rest of Britain right down the middle. Whatever the outcome of these negotiations, or people talk about the, you know, the economic comps of Brexit, but you know, here and now, the country is completely divided. Secondly, the United Kingdom is more shaky than any time it's been since the beginning of the 18th century, you know, when it was uh, created, uh, when, um, you know, when Scotland joined the Act of Union or really from uh, uh, the being, uh, you know, from three or 400 years ago. So um, uh, 
I think those are sort of the really big changes on the map. And you can see, you know, we already had Scottish nationalism. You know, it's an age of rising nationalism. You have rather more incoherent English nationalism on the march. So you can feel things shaking and a degree of division that, uh, in Britain that uh, I don't think anybody has seen for hundreds of years. And you noted an irony in one of your recent columns on Brexit by recalling that the advocates of Brexit tended to cloak their advocacy in the language of patriotism. And yet the yeah. result of what they had called for is actually causing such disunity that Britain is it's losing its station on the world stage. And it's and it perhaps- Sure, yeah, it's, uh, you know, that. Uh, and this you know, disunity I think is gonna be lasting, you know. Uh, you know, obviously the U.S. is divided, you know, over Trump. But this is sort of this is sort of uh, a very sort of different atmosphere than I've ever known in Britain before. I think anybody else has known for a very long time. Um, and I think that that's a change that you know that's already happened. People often discuss this: what will be the final outcome of Brexit? Will there be an economic calamity or not? You know, I sort of rather doubt that. I don't think that that's perhaps even the most important thing. The, uh, I think the difference is that we have this sort of tremendous political disunity between different parts of the United Kingdom and uh, within England as well. Uh, so I think that that's, that's already a change. And of course it diminishes uh, what Britain can do internationally. Not that Britain was doing very much internationally in the first place, generally just following the US, but it certainly does diminish its uh, uh, ability to get its way in the world. Uh, and again, I think that'll go on for quite a long time. And does the difference there in terms of how the divide is manifesting in the UK versus the United States over Trump have to do with the the Brexit debate and you know the, the, the Scottish nationalists in the debate, they cut to the core of how UK society is oriented in a structural sense. Whereas with Trump, he's sort of just a, an actor within the system, at least so far. Is that does that kind of touch on why there is a key difference there? Well, I think that you know that also in uh, you know the U.S. is a bigger power; it can probably get away with more instability. Mm. Uh, it's not so clear that Britain can. You know, Britain was always traditionally been the stable part of Europe. You know, that's why. Uh, people move to London and uh, so forth because, you know, why? Because the place is an island, you know, because the place hasn't been invaded for a long time. It hasn't had a revolution, you know, for since the 17th century. Uh, now it's beginning to shake. Um, and nobody quite knows what the consequences of that will be. Uh, you know, we never really had, the English, you know, had various sort of, at a very sort of strong sense of their own identity, but it was so strong they didn't really have to wear it on their sleeve. Uh, the new type of, uh, you know, it, anybody could become uh, British. The new type of English nationalism is much more uh, closer to old um, continental nationalism. It's much more sort of ethnic uh, and it's much more exclusive. Uh, so we'll, you know, we have to see what kind of what the consequence will be. Uh, so we're kind of unknown uh, territory here. Um, and it was kind of rather amazing, you know, they, I remember in the uh, uh, the last, uh, the general election um, in uh, uh, a couple of years ago when uh, all the Labour members of Parliament lost their uh, seats and they were replaced by Scottish nationalists uh, overwhelmingly. And all the conservatives were applauding this. But actually what had happened was that a pro-union party had been replaced by an anti-union party, which achieved complete political domination in Scotland. You know, Scotland is one third of the area of Britain. It's a bit under 10% of the population. This was a major change. But the uh, sort of conservative elite, the people who are governing the country, couldn't see for a long time that this was really a very, important wounding uh, blow uh, to the unity of the country that was gonna have long-term consequences. 
And that conservative elite should cheer events which could lead to the dissolution of the United Kingdom. It's probably one of the great ironies of history, right? It is pretty peculiar, yeah. Um, the why have they done it? You know, why did they have the Brexit vote? Well, a series of miscalculations, you know, that uh, to do with British politics. That uh, David Cameron, the Prime Minister, didn't think he thought he'd have a coalition with the Lib Dems, so he thought he could offer the right wing of his party, the people who wanted to leave the European Union, a referendum, in the knowledge that. This either he be in a coalition and his liberal democratic parties would uh, veto that. Of course, he won the election, uh, so we had to. Uh, he offered this, but why was it 50 percent? Why wasn't it 60 percent for such a major constitutional change? So a sort of series of miscalculations. You know, in the past, the sort of British elite uh, had a sort of international reputation and a domestic reputation of being pretty smart and pretty cool. But what's so striking in the last few years is how clap-handed they've been, how disastrous their policies have been, and how quickly things are unraveling. Uh, just to wrap up, I, there was a news item that I came across this morning um, where Francois Fillon, the uh, presidential candidate for an upcoming French presidential election, he was um, addressing this notion that's being espoused in the US Senate now that Russia is on such a worldwide rampage that they're now even seeking to, quote, interfere with the French election. And Fillon seemed to dismiss that as uh, fabulism. Um, what is your <laughs> take on this use of, of Russia as a cudgel in all manner of different circumstances? I'm sort of astonished and you know, occasionally sort of amused that the idea that Russia, you know, which is not you know, it's a pretty limited economic power, it's fairly limited military power, it's got some nuclear weapons. It's suddenly, you know, the great bear is on the march again, you know. This is as if the sort of Red Army was about to sweep into Berlin and march on to the Rhine. You know, this is absurd. Uh, you know, it mostly comes from, what does it come from? It uh, comes from, uh, I guess, liberal elites who sort of, would quite like to, you know, feel there was a threat out there um, to justify their existence. Um, you know, it's a, a handy uh, weapon against Trump uh, for the media. But I think it's just, uh, it's absurd. It's a complete exaggeration of Russian power. How do you interfere in a, in a, in a, in a, in a, a French election? How do you interfere in an American election? You know, this. Uh, when it actually comes to producing any evidence that they did anything significant, you know, it, it never seems to be there. And nobody has produced any hard evidence that I've seen. Um, you know, there was a, this document about uh, Trump uh, claiming that uh, um, uh, he'd uh, done all these things in Russia. And you looked at what the sources were. And, you know, I used to be Moscow correspondent on these two occasions in the 80s. and. Uh, again, at the uh, the turn of the century, and there you had these claims that a you know, senior intelligent figure in the Kremlin had told somebody this and somebody else in the foreign ministry, you know, giving the idea that the uh, you know you could just uh, in Moscow you could access all these intelligence officers uh, and others and find out all this damaging information. You know, this is absurd. This is comic book stuff. Uh, but it was all being taken very uh, seriously by the American and uh, uh, British media because it's a way of getting at Trump. But you know, this is, uh, you know, I, I, uh, if you read this, I thought with any uh, attempt at objectivity, you could see most of it was nonsense. And it's such a dominant factor now in American political life that it seems like every other day there is some salacious breaking news item that is supposed to finally provide the smoking gun evidence of some grand conspiracy or some collusion or coordination or whatever the term happens to be. So I don't see it the yeah, I they, abating they do it in soon. Moscow. I mean, you know, they're probably a bit frightened by this that suddenly, you know, they're being demonized in this fashion. They're probably a bit flattered that they're considered to have such fantastic influence. They can reach into the U.S. body politic, you know, and determine the way that Wisconsin votes, you know. Uh, this is absurd, you know. 
any more than they can do that in France. Um, of course, these types of exaggerations, these uh, this sort of um, threat enhancement, uh, have consequences. Military budgets get, get higher, you know, confrontations take place. This could all get out of hand. So that is sort of uh, uh, frightening. Um, and, uh, you know, there isn't much attempt to uh, to rein it in. Um, so, but uh, overall, yeah, I don't... Uh, I think there's very little in this, um, but and it's sort of it's getting to the point, you know, this sort of point that anybody who's run into any any politician has run into any Russian over the last few years that this becomes a um, a case for suspicion and so forth. But actually, what they're meant to have done in Europe, French elections or anybody else, election. You know, actually, look at it. It's all, it's all fantasy. It's all, uh, it's all uh, attempting to turn this into a political weapon. And the big theme at the Senate hearing yesterday on Russian subversion methods um, was that anybody could theoretically be an quote unwitting agent if they advance ideas that are seen as, in some tangential sense, favorable to the Kremlin. Um, when you were in Moscow, was this unwitting agent idea something that had any currency, or what is what is what is the context? Uh, of this it's you always, you know, the Bolshevik, the old Bolsheviks in the 1920s used to, and under Stalin used to have a rather chilling version of this, which was they would accuse somebody of some crime uh, against the uh, Soviet state and so forth, uh, and. Uh, the, the person would say, but I didn't do that. I wasn't in that place. I did nothing to it. Uh, I don't uh, hold those views. And then they would say, well, tell us who supports you and we'll tell you who you are. In other words, your identity is, you know, who on whose side are you? Then we decide, uh, you know, what whether you're guilty or not. Uh, so, of course, somebody can um, uh, decide that your views uh, in to their minds uh, um, are an assistance to Russia, and therefore somehow you're an unwitting agent. But <laughs> these were very much the uh, the arguments that um, you know the uh, Russian um, uh, KGB used to use. Uh, you know when they attacked dissidents and so forth, who'd say, "No, we haven't done anything against the Soviet state," but they'd say, "Ah, but uh, you know that um, uh, your views are." Uh, uh, different and therefore you're an unwitting agent of the US. But this is the talk. This is the sort of thing you have in authoritarian states. That's what's so disgusting and so worrying is, uh, uh, you know, you see the same thing in Turkey. You see all in all these states are becoming more authoritarian. Uh, journalists and others are being arrested, you know, in Turkey because they're supporters of terrorism. Why? Because, you know, those uh, whether well, President Erdogan and Erdogan is the great enemy of terrorism and uh, so forth, and therefore they are unwittingly or wittingly assisting those terrorists. It's that type of argument, and of course it undermines democracy. It undermines freedom of speech. It's uh, a road to clapping people in jail for their uh, opinions. Well, we will have to leave it there, Patrick Coburn. It was a pleasure speaking to you. Thank you for joining us on the Young Turks. Thank you.